It's a race against the clock as new mutations continue to evolve. Health officials blame high infection rates for the new strains. Each new infection opens the door to unknown variants, which threaten to undo the progress. There is now a clear, real danger of mutations making the virus more transmissible, more lethal, and more resistant to existing vaccines. And we must act fast. Understanding what's driving the virus's mutations, a crucial next step in our race against COVID-19. New mutations have seen the virus spread like wildfire in parts of the world. But more help is on the way. The US biotech firm Novavax has developed a vaccine demonstrating almost 90% efficacy in a phase three trial and proving successful against variants. It's the mutations that scientists say we need to keep an eye on. Last week, EU authorities urged member states to do more on sequencing the genome of the novel coronavirus. The hope is that scientists can detect mutations earlier and keep track on how they spread. So far, major new variants have been identified in South Africa, the UK and in Brazil. All of them a cause for concern, as they spread much faster. The reason is a mutation in the so-called spike protein that helps them attach more easily to human cells. The changes are not believed to cause a greater severity of illness, but the higher rate of transmission means more cases, putting even more pressure on healthcare systems. In many countries, there are already shortages of ventilators, intensive care units and staff. Plus, slowing down the spread of those new strains would require even more stringent lockdown measures. Initial studies have shown that BioNTech Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine is likely to be effective against the variant found in the UK. But scientists warn that may not be true for the strain found in Brazil. This subtype even seems to be spreading in Manaus where 75% of the population had previous exposure to SARS-CoV-2. That could mean two things, scientists say, either that people remain vulnerable because their first infection was too long ago, or that the virus has mutated to such an extent that it's resistant to existing antibodies. Virologists are still conducting research into what that would mean for the efficacy of the vaccines. If it turns out that they do not provide protection against this new type of coronavirus, the vaccines would have to be updated. The good news is, as the BioNTech-Pfizer vaccine and the one made by Moderna use synthetic messenger RNA or mRNA, they can both be quickly adapted. Scientists have suggested the changes could be made in as little as six weeks. But testing the new vaccine and authorizing it might take much longer. Pari Sabeti is a computational geneticist at Harvard and was voted Time magazine's 100 most influential people. Dr. Sabeti, you sequenced Ebola samples from patients, marking the first in-depth use of real-time DNA sequencing in a pandemic. How's that changed our approach to the coronavirus? Um, I mean, it is, it's a fundamentally different world where we don't, six months after an outbreak passes, we don't find out what happened. We can actually uh, respond to it right away. Um, basically, the genome of a virus is its blueprint. It's uh, you know, how we track it, how we diagnose it, um, and how it uh, evolves over time. So we want to get real-time snapshots to know what the virus is doing at every moment and to constantly develop countermeasures that target that virus. So we were too late. Did we miss the boat? I mean, you sequenced Ebola really early on. Um, did, did, did we miss out in this case? No, actually, we were very fast in our genome sequencing, the original discovery of the virus. Um, that was one of the really sort of sad things about this is such a missed opportunity because we actually looks like we caught the virus very soon after it entered human populations and began transmitting from human to human. Um, the problem is that respiratory viruses 
move quickly. And so even though we were very fast, we had to be lightning fast. And while the sequencing in the original instantiation was actually where it needed to be, uh, our ability to then turn those into diagnostics, um, well, actually, we did that quickly too, but then to get those diagnostics everywhere in the world so we could find it when it came, that was where we dropped off. That's where we missed the boat. So, you know, um, the United States being a, a, a famous example of that, you know, going backwards where we were just months into the outbreak, still didn't really have any capacity to, to look for it, um, and even had some regulatory challenges and things like that, that was that was what needs to change going forward. But actually, the original sequencing was right on. Uh, we still, there's a lot we can do to keep up that sequencing to figure out, as this virus has millions and millions of uh, chances to move, we need to keep up with it even faster. Well, the British, Brazilian, and South African variants were assigned to specific virus lines, but no direct ancestors were identified. How's that problematic? You know, it's, it's just telling us that we're not capturing enough information, that we essentially, uh, we don't know where the virus went first and, and how it got there. So we're still, the thing is, we're, we're doing more sequencing than we've ever done before, but we're, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of cases now. So it's a, it's, a, it's a whole different world of how much you need to capture to really see what this virus is doing. Um, and, and just relative to the amount of cases, we're still sequencing very little. You've said we're in a race against time as the virus may stumble upon a mutation that makes it more dangerous. How much time do we have? It's hard to know. Um, that's the thing. It, it's basically no time. We should move immediately. The the, the way it works is uh, every time a virus replicates and transmits to a new person, there's opportunities for new mutations to occur. Most of those mutations don't have a real biological effect, but if you give it millions of chances to happen, even the most rare event can happen. And so every every new case is a new opportunity for the virus to stumble upon something. You know, And we're, we're worried now because the virus is uh, you know, looks like it's more infectious and looks like it can escape the immune system. It could also change and somehow begin to affect our children. We don't know where it's going to go. So we don't really want to waste a moment to find out. But a guest on this show told me mutations work like clockwork. Why then can't we predict them better? Well, we can predict how often they'll likely occur. And what, what we can predict, um, uh, yeah, we can, we can predict essentially like the, they do work like clockwork or certain uh, every kind of every cycle, there's a certain opportunity for infections to happen. And so we have a sense of how many mutations will come. Mm -hmm. We just don't know the biological effect. We don't know. We know some of it. We're learning. We, we know we pay attention to the ones that are in the spike protein because we know that's going to affect the it's how it's going to affect cells. And there's there's different things we're 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 paying attention to. But we don't know the full biological logic of the genome and how it works and which exact mutation going to have which biological effect. That's part of what some of these studies are doing when they do gain of function to try to see what happens. But those are those are challenging for various reasons. So we're still not there yet. But the more we study, the more we know and the more we can predict. And when vaccinating, how much higher is the risk of a mutation if someone's got the first dose, but the second's been delayed when, when it comes to a two shot vaccine? You know, we, don't, we don't really know. Uh, I mean, I think that um, the more our immune system bats it down early, the less chance it has to change. And so, uh, so you know, the best thing we can do is to um, prevent. The best thing we can do is to prevent infections and um, and to sort of shore up so that our infection doesn't go to anybody else. So, you know, th th those are kinds of the things where it's like if our immune system bats it down, or if we quarantine well, and that new variant doesn't go go anywhere, then that's the best thing we can do. Patti Sabetti from Harvard, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. Let me hand you over now to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. He's got answers to your questions on the coronavirus. If I get vaccinated, is there a chance I could still get infected and infect others? Yes, to the first, and um, we don't know yet to the second. Uh, we'll have a much better idea about the dangers of both issues in a few months when, when vaccination numbers really climb in, in a serious way worldwide. Um, I think the confusion about this topic is closely tied to how we use the words infected and infectious. Um, let's look at the word infected first. Um, it's used in two different ways. Um, in its strict sense, 
It just means carrying a pathogen that causes a disease. Um, but it's often also used to describe symptomatically having the disease. Um, and after exposure to this pathogen, you can theoretically be both or just one. Um, you can carry SARS-CoV-2 and have symptoms, but you can also carry it and not have symptoms, maybe even after you've been vaccinated. Um, I'll get back to that in a minute. But first, let's look at the word infectious. Um, it means the virus is reproducing in your body, whether you notice it or not, and that you're shedding enough of it to pass it on to others. Um, we don't yet know if this is possible even after you've received a vaccine, because although trials showed vaccinated people later very rarely developed symptoms of COVID-19, um, those trials weren't set up to show whether they also acquired what's called a sterilizing immunity. Um, that's when your immune response after vaccination wipes out any subsequent exposures so fast the pathogen never gains a foothold in your body, um, effectively ruling you out as a link in an infection chain. Um, but right now, we still don't know if you could theoretically get infected after vaccination, just show no symptoms, um, yet still give it to others. We'll have a better idea when we see whether large-scale vaccine campaigns affect numbers of new infections uh, quickly and dramatically.